Welcome. If you manage patients anywhere across the globe, you already know resuscitation guidelines aren't quite universal. Today, we're putting the American Heart Association ACLS 2025 and the European Resuscitation Council 2025 guidelines right next to each other. And for healthcare providers, these guidelines are our standard of care, right? Mm -hmm. But they change. New evidence constantly shapes them. Understanding precisely where the AHA and ERC differ on these specific numbers, the milligrams, the joules, it directly impacts how you practice, especially if you work across different systems or try to synthesize the best global knowledge. Okay, let's begin with bradycardia, the slow heart rates. First line treatment is often atropine. And right away, we see a difference in that initial dose. What's the exact numeric split there between AHA and ERC starting doses? Yeah, the difference hits you immediately. It's distinct. So the AHA guideline recommends starting with one milligram of intravenous atropine. And you can repeat that every three to five minutes. Importantly, the AHA total dose is capped at three milligrams, no more than that. The ERC, though, they start lower. Uh, 0.5 milligrams intravenous atropine is the recommendation. Same interval, repeat every three to five minutes. And like the AHA, the maximum total dose is also three milligrams. Okay, so AHA hits harder initially one milligram versus the ERC's 0 0.5 milligrams. Double the dose right out of the gate. The ERC approach leans towards titration, finding the effective dose. The AHA seems to favor getting to a possibly therapeutic level faster. So you need to recognize one milligram start, that's the U.S. standard, but 0.5 milligrams. That's the accepted norm in Europe for the first try. All right, let's flip to fast heart rates. Adenosine for stable supraventricular tachycardia. Now, both guidelines agree on the first two doses, which simplifies things a bit. But does the ERC offer an extra step, an escalation option the AHA doesn't formally include? Well, the first two doses are identical, which is helpful for consistency. Both say six milligrams intravenously first. If that doesn't work, both recommend 12 milligrams intravenously for the second dose. No difference there. The variation pops up if those two standard doses fail. The AHA protocol is essentially stops defining doses there, but the ERC, they specifically add a numeric option for a third dose. That's 18 milligrams intravenously. 18 milligrams. Okay, that's a key difference. Why formalize that 18 milligram dose? Is there evidence suggesting it has a meaningful success rate after 12 milligrams has failed? It really looks like formalizing clinical judgment. You know, the ERC acknowledges some patients just need more drug, and they define that higher dose numerically. It gives providers a standard next step if 12 milligrams doesn't convert the rhythm. I see. So for you, if you're following ERC, you have a clear path up to 18 milligrams Oops. before you'd move to, say, electricity. If you're following AHA after that 12 milligram dose fails, you're likely moving straight to synchronized cardioversion. Got it. Clear pathway difference. Now for wide complex tachycardia, think ventricular tachycardia with a pulse. Imuterone is a go-to drug here, and wow, the dosing strategies look really different. We're comparing 150 milligrams versus 300 milligrams for that initial load. Can you lay out the specifics, the load, and then the maintenance infusion for both? Yes, this is arguably where we see the biggest dosing gap. It reflects two different ideas about therapeutic speed. Okay, the AHA loading dose, 150 milligrams intravenous amiodarone, usually given over 10 minutes. And that 150 milligram bolus, it can be repeated if the VT comes back. The maintenance infusion after that, it's one milligram per minute for the first six hours. Okay, 150 load, one per minute maintenance. Right. Now, the ERC, they start much more aggressively. Their loading dose is 300 milligrams intravenous amiodarone, and they give it over 10 to 20 minutes. So double the initial dose. Following that much larger load, the maintenance infusion is defined differently too. It's a total of 900 milligrams given over the next 24 hours. So 300 milligrams load versus 150. Exactly, double. When the ERC goes for that heavy initial load, does that mean they're trying to hit therapeutic blood levels much, much faster? And maybe accepting a higher potential risk, like hypotension from the drug solvent, rather than waiting for saturation? That really seems to be the trade-off. Doubling the load definitely speeds up the time to antiarrhythmic effect, which, you know, is critical in potentially unstable rhythms. But that faster saturation, you have to manage it carefully. Watch the blood pressure. The AHA's 150 milligrams is a more cautious step, perhaps letting you monitor tolerance better before the full dose is in. For the provider, knowing that 300 milligram load is standard ERC practice means you're dealing with a very high initial concentration compared to the usual 150 you might use under AHA guidelines. Big difference. Okay, let's switch gears from drugs to electricity. Synchronized cardioversion. The energy recommendations in joules, they show not just number differences, but maybe a fundamental difference in philosophy about escalation. How do the recommended energy settings compare for different rhythms? Okay, for AFib, the AHA recommends starting at 200 joules. 200. 
and the idea is potentially escalating stepwise if needed. 200 joules start, okay. The ERC, however, recommends an initial synchronized shock at the maximum defibrillator output. Right away, they completely bypass starting lower and escalating its maximum power from the first attempt. It absolutely seems to favor speed and first shock success. The evidence does suggest higher energy shocks are often more effective initially for atrial fibrillation. So if you practice under ERC guidelines, your process has to include checking your specific device's maximum output, could be 360 joules, could be something else depending on the model, and selecting that right off the bat. It eliminates that potential delay of starting low, failing, going higher, failing again, and so on. Makes sense from an efficiency standpoint. Now, looking at some other rhythms, we see more numeric variations too. For atrial flutter and paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia, the ERC actually recommends a lower initial energy. They suggest starting at 70 joules, ranging up to 120 joules. Interesting. Lower for those. And what about ventricular tachycardia with a pulse? Okay, for narrow complex tachycardia A and D for monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, when there's a pulse, the AHA recommends 100 joules to start. 100. The ERC pushes higher for that monomorphic VT with a pulse. They recommend starting at 120 joules, ranging up to 150 joules. So again, for a ventricular rhythm, the European guidelines seem to lean towards a slightly more powerful initial shock compared to AHA's 100. And finally, for polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, the AHA is very clear. Unsynchronized, high-energy shock. Basically, treat it like V-fib. Immediate defibrillation. Yeah, that pattern seems pretty clear. While AHA often gives specific, maybe mid-range starting numbers, the ERC frequently recommends either a higher initial dose, like with amiodarone or like with AFib cardioversion, tells you to use the device's maximum capability right away. These aren't minor tweaks. They are really distinct clinical approaches. Mm. So summing this up, these numeric differences, we've walked through that 0.5 versus 1 milligram atropine start, the 300 versus 150 milligram amiodarone load, and these really different electrical strategies, they represent critical divergences in how resuscitation is performed globally. Knowing these precise numbers isn't optional, it's essential. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. And the practical takeaway for you, the provider, is understanding the, um, the risk-benefit thinking behind each guideline set. The ERC often seems to favor immediacy, higher initial impact, more drug, more jewels may be aiming for stability faster. The AISHA often seems to favor more standardized, perhaps cautious, step-by-step -step approach. Now, here's something to think about as we finish. If the ERC strongly pushes for starting AFib cardioversion at maximum defibrillator output, what does that imply for training and equipment, specifically regarding biphasic versus older monophasic devices? Does this aggressive stance implicitly encourage institutions to phase out lower-powered monophasic machines faster just to meet that high initial joules recommendation? That's something worth reflecting on when you think about your institution's equipment, procurement, and training standards. 